Let's take you live to Paul Keating now, speaking at the Press Club. For a conversation about Australia's strategic framework, which is being beamed back to the Press Club in Canberra, from where members of the working press will put questions to him after our conversation. In his long career in federal politics, Paul Keating was one of the most regular speakers at the National Press Club. Between 1983 and 1996, he appeared 19 times as Treasurer and Prime Minister and, in 1991, as Labor's most prominent backbencher. Mr Keating, welcome to the National Press Club. It's good to have you back. Good, Laura. Nice to be with you. Yeah. It's been almost 26 years, uh, a long time. That suggests you feel there's something significant you want to talk about uh, on, the, on the back of the subject of today's conversation. Well, I haven't rushed back. Let's make the point. But I'm back to talk about what I see as a deterioration in our strategic settings. Um, you know, I think uh, the country is now very much at odds with its geography uh, and, uh, and it's lost its way. I thought rather than me provide a speech, a set speech, you and I would have a conversation about this uh, off perhaps off notes. Uh, but I want to get to this point. We, we arrived here in 11 little boats, one-tenth the size of a manly ferry, and after dropping anchor at what we call Sydney Cove, then claimed the whole 4,000-kilometre hinterland, 2,500 miles. I mean, for Hutchpah, that takes a bit of beating, you know? Um, and, and we got away with it not because of our treatment of the poor Aborigines who ended up getting the rough end of the stick right from the get-go, but we got away with it even after other states like parts of then Indonesia, uh, the Kingdom of Thailand, then Siam, uh, China and its large mercantile fleets, they could have claimed Australia in the 16th or the 17th or the 18th century. But here it was waiting for us the greatest gift any nation has ever been given. An island, a continent of their own and a border with nobody. Um, and uh, all we had to do, all we had to do to keep it is be in it, be in the region. Be in the region and be happy to be in the region. What a gift. What a gift. You know, what was it? Just a, a, a virtually a handful of us, you know. Um, but no, we're, we're not happy to be in the region. We're still trying to find our security from Asia rather than in Asia. So here we had the Prime Minister uh, going back to Cornwall where James Cook had left 245 years earlier and where Arthur Phillip and the First Fleet had left 233 years earlier. Here we are back there to find our security from Asia. I mean, the ignominy of it. The appalling ignominy of it uh, speaks, speaks volumes about our, our incapacity to absorb the region, enjoy the region, be part of the region and, uh, and, to, uh, and to celebrate the fact we've been here. Um, the thing is, um, we, the area that matters most to Australia, the area where which should be our strategic habitat is the Indonesian archipelago. 250 million people in an arc across the northern reaches of Australia, uh, a central part of ASEAN. Um, <clears throat> this should be where, and in my time as Prime Minister, where I focused most particularly, uh, and other as well, but particularly myself, um, w this is where we, we matter most. But instead of that, we've now got this sort of fiction, you know, the thing called the Indo-Pacific, like a big rectangular box. You know, and on one end of the box is India, and the other end of the box is Japan. Uh, but, in other words, but, but we're not focusing on the middle of the box, which is Indonesia and ASEAN, we're on either end. It's like, a, it's like a seesaw at the park, you know. We're on the wobbly ends, but not the pivot at the middle, right? And, of course, it's, this is just a fiction. There is no way, no way India is going to find itself with any naval military flotilla in the South China Sea to protect us from China, uh, unless the Chinese in somehow <clears throat> t 
turn in a big position in the Indian Ocean. If the Chinese are not in the Indian Ocean, then there's no way the Indians are going to be in the South China Sea. I've always believed that that in India will never be part of the East Asian system um, and, and that uh, us believing that we can have a meeting in the White House and we call it the Quad and the Indians are going to be there. I mean, we need to remember this. The country in the world closest to India is Russia. They have an inter intercountry commission that was set up in Indira Gandhi's time with the Soviet Union. That is still principally their principal relationship in the world. 75% of their military equipment comes from Russia. India is part of the, of, of the uh, Shanghai Cooperation Conference, which includes Pakistan, China, um, uh, some of the stand countries. Um, uh, in other words, India, India looks west to Pakistan and the Middle East. It does not look east to East Asia. That is the real position. Now, is that too hard to work out? You know, is that too hard for people to work? Now, take Japan. Let's take Japan. Here they are. The, the Bourbons, the LDP, Liberal Democratic Party, the Bourbons of the Pacific, learned nothing and forgotten nothing. You know, um, 80, 80, years, 80 years they've had to atone for the crimes committed by themselves uh, in, in Manchuria uh, and, of course, in the rape of Nanjing, then the Chinese capital in 1937, you know. Fundamentally, they won't do it. So, so they, they should have reached a point of accommodation with China years ago. I mean, for years they should have seen China rising and understood the scale of it. You know, there's 160 million of them. There's 1.4 billion Chinese. So, I mean, if you had tuppence worth of common sense, you're a Japanese leader, you would be accommodating yourself to China, finding a point of accommodation. No, no, they're hanging out for some quad which has us in it the Americans in it and the Indians in it, you know. I mean, this is a sort of, a sort of, uh, a kind of, you know, hopeless, uh, the, the kind of hopeless environment we're we're, we're in. So, so the thing is that that um, um, uh, uh, Japan will not settle with China. Um, it relies upon um, uh, American presence, and and. So I've taken the view always that engagement with China and its absorption, its absorption of the region will establish a better framework for both China and the United States to work in, including Australia. And China is simply too big and too central to be ostracised. You know, I want to quote something which I think is important. It's a big new Brzezinski. You know, after Nixon went... Nixon had the meeting with Mao to do the great rapprochement. Nixon lost the presidency and President Jimmy Carter followed him, you know. Um, and Zbigniew Brzezinski was Carter's foreign policy advisor. He was the one left to do the Mao deal, right? Now, Brzezinski is a Pole. Uh, he was 12, 11 or 12 years of age when Stalin and Hitler cut Poland into two. He would have been 15 or 16 when Warsaw was wiped out. And this is a guy, uh, in terms of sort of hardline ideologues, this is a guy who is on the hard right of the American scene, Atlantic scene. He has this to say. He said, America should tac tac tacitly, tacitly accept the reality of China's geopolitical preeminence on the main mainland of Asia, as well as China's ongoing emergence as a predominant Asian economic power. Right? This is the coldest of the Cold War warriors. The coldest, right? America should tacitly accept the reality of Chinese geopolitical preeminence on the mainland of Asia, as well as China's ongoing emergence as a predominant Asian economic power. America's strategic uh, policy strategy should not, to, should not be to contain China, but to engage it in a larger hub of cooperative relationships that by themselves also help shape their own relationship between the US and China. Now, the, 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 this is where the smart, hard guys are uh, in, 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 relation, in relation to China. So, so we've got to say, well, you know, this is not happening and what is happening. And here I'd like to just talk about, you know, I've always believed, you know, 
you've followed my career a long time, I always think the big coordinates command the picture, you know. In, in October 2020, the IMF in its annual report nominated China as the world's largest economy, right? It's, it says China's economy is now 20% larger than the United States, 24 trillion versus 20 trillion, a report which was endorsed by the CIA. So you've got, you've got uh, the IMF and the CIA out there saying China is 20% bigger than the United States now, now. Um, and these are the key numbers. I don't know whether journalists write notes these days or it's all audio-visual, but these are the key numbers. American GDP per capita is 60,000. Chinese GDP per capita is 10,000. 10 versus 60. But as China is moving out of its old model of cheap manufactured goods into higher orders of manufacturing and services, uh, this, their incomes are going to, going to rise. But at 10,000 US dollars per capita, China is 120% bigger than the US. How many years is it going to take China to get to 20,000? Not 60. There's no way the Chinese are going to get to 60,000, but, but with this highly urbanised, developed economy of theirs, what, it'll take a decade, perhaps? So if it gets to 20,000 US per capita, it will be two and a half times bigger than the United States, 250% of the United States. To which the United States says, well, that's all very interesting, but look, if you behave yourself, you Chinese, you can be a stakeholder in our system. You know, this is the Bob Zellick line. You know, we welcome China as a stakeholder. And look, you wouldn't have to be Xi Jinping or anybody to take the view of you're a Chinese national to say, well, hang on, let me get this right. We are already one and a quarter times bigger than you. We'll soon be twice as big as you, and we may be two and a half times as big as you, but we can be a stakeholder in your system. Is that it? <laughs> you know, I mean, it would make a cat laugh. You know, that's, how, that's, that's, that's the sort of the, where, where we are. Yeah, a, that is a stakeholder, a stakeholder in a US-run system. And you see, this is the G7. They all met in Cornwall, you know, backslapping operation in Cornwall. All the good guys met in Cornwall. All the bad guys were left out. You know, the G20 didn't meet, you know. Um, and guess what? The bad guys didn't turn up. When we got to Glasgow, China wasn't there. Russia wasn't there. These are the big emitters, you know. So for the global, even for the global commons, we could have, can't get this right. My point is that, that China is now so big and is going to grow so large, it, it ha will have no precedent in modern economic or social history and therefore, our challenge is to be is to have the United States remain as a balancing and conciliating power in Asia, which I've said over and over again, but have it come to a point of accommodation where it acknowledges China's preeminence in East Asia and the Asian mainland. And in which case, we can start to move towards a sensible relationship again with China instead of taking... Now, look, the Chinese are in their rude phase, you know, they're, they've got the, they're in the adolescent phase of their diplomacy, they've got testosterone running everywhere, uh, you know, but, but we have to deal with them because their power will be so profoundly big in this part of the world. So, you know, here we are running to Cornwall to find our security in Asia. <laughs> I mean, really, you know... So, you know, so we are at odds with our geography and we have lost our way. Well, let's start with talking about China. Yeah. Uh, the, the big change in the last four or five years is that people have become alarmed about where China is heading. Yeah. Uh, they see it as being aggressive in the South China Sea with the build-up of um, military... Uh, assets on uh, islands, 27 outposts in the Spratly and Paracel Islands, for example. Yeah. What? And you have been accused by, by, by some commentators of being a chief apologist for China. Hmm. What do you believe China's ambitions are? Well, I'll deal with a couple of these points, including the apologist point. Look, 
China... Uh, uh, Henry Kissinger said something which is worth repeating here, which is a, a, a pretty much my own view, if I can find it. I wrote this down in a meeting I had with him. He said... He did not believe China has a military-based policy designed to achieve military domination, nor is its policy about annexing contiguous territories, in other words, the countries around it. He thought its overarching policy objective was to keep the US away from Chinese borders. He said he did not believe China wants a confrontation with the United States. He said being Chinese... Being Chinese, the Chinese will develop a concept of coexistence. So basically what they're saying is until not many years ago, the US Pacific Fleet drove 12 miles off the edge of the, the Chinese ter territorial sea on the Chinese continental shelf, you know. Could you imagine the attitude of the United States if the Chinese Blue Water Navy was sailing 12 miles off the territorial sea of California? I mean, there'd be, there'd be outrage everywhere. So what the Chinese have been doing is, is getting what's called in the trade sea denial, pushing the American fleet off their coast, you know, broadly, this is it. But the Chinese interests are not, are not in the east. They are in the west. China, China's real interests are in the stand countries. Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, Pakistan, China... China will control, not control is not the right word, but through the Belt and Road and the capital programs, if you go from Wuhan, the city where the rivers cross and the railways cross, the Chinese will be the major influence between everything between Wuhan and Istanbul. You What's know. their interest in doing? Why, why, why are they heading west? Well, partly to increase their strategic power and secondly... All of the old tech, which has been replaced by the new tech as they climb out of the middle income trap, that is steel, glass, cement. People say, well, what are they going to do with their big cement plants, their big steel plants, their glass plants? What are they going to do with it? The answer is what they're going to do with it is push it down the road. They're going to put it into Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, Pakistan. You know, this is where Chinese interest right now. You don't get this you don't get this in the Australian public debate because it's informed by the, by the spooks, you know. Uh, it's informed by the... Uh, our foreign policy debate now at Can in Canberra is informed by the security agencies, you know. Uh, and um, um, uh, so you, you, you're, not, you're not getting a, a macro view, you know, uh, a, 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 macro, a macro view of of China as it really is. I mean, China wants its front doorstep and its front porch, that is Taiwan, its sea. It doesn't want American naval forces in influence. It wants access out of its coast into the deeper waters of the Mariana Trench in the Pacific. That, that's what it's about, fundamentally. Well, let's now, go would back. I, would I, could they have had this anyway? Did they need to build the islands? Probably not. You know, what, did I think it was incautious of them to do it? Probably yes, but but would would we appreciate having having you know uh, would any country appreciate a fleet as large and as powerful as the United States twelve miles off your coast? When considering you are a bigger state than they are, you know. So going back to the South China Sea, though, um, there is a lot of uh, contest and competition for resources there, for natural gas, for fishing rights. Yeah. Uh, with uh, countries in the region, like the Philippines, like Vietnam. Yeah. China is being a lot more aggressive there. Yeah. yeah. Look, I'll tell you what I said. You know, I have these... some of these blackguards who report me, you know. In Beijing, not in, not in Canberra, in Beijing, I said this in 2013. Every, I said, a lot of attention has been given to America's responsibility to respond to China's rise. Right? And this is in a heavyweight meeting, right? Members of the government, vice premier. I said, but China too has equal responsibility for creating a new stable and sustainable order in Asia. As it steps up to a larger leadership role, it will at the same time need to be willing to accept and respect 
restraints on the way in which it uses its immense strength because the acceptance of any such restraints by great powers is the key to any successful and durable international order. Then I went on to make these points. First, and most obviously, China should continually reaffirm by word and by deed its commitment to repudiate the use or threat of force to settle disputes, just as other powers do. The stronger China becomes, the more it will need to reassure its neighbours about this, and this will depend on deeds more than words. You know, I mean, these are tough things to say in Beijing. And I said this, China will do a great deal to help build a continuing stable order in Asia if it quite unambiguously welcomes and supports a continued strong role for the United States in Asia. A stable Asian order can no longer be based on sole US leadership, but equally, there can be no stable and peaceful future in Asia unless the United States plays a large and active role and unless China accepts that role. I mean, how much tougher, how much tougher do you need to be to have the Ning Nongs of the Sydney Morning Herald and the Age notice this, you know? You know? Um, so, just speaking about tough, though, um, and words rather than... Uh, deeds rather than words, yeah. um, the, uh, the uh, tribunal in The Hague found in uh, the Philippines' favour under, uh, under the UN Treaty of the Sea... Uh, China isn't uh, uh, yeah. respecting that rule. That's yeah. that's not what it should be doing, based on what yeah. you've said. Look, so, uh, Laura, big powers are uh, big powers are rude. Do you think there were any Polynesian Hawaiians on the Mayflower when it hit the east coast of America? Do you think there were any natives of Guam on the Mayflower when it arrived, or Filipinos? I mean, these are all purloined by the United States. You know, big countries are rude. They do this stuff. Well, speaking of rude, how rude should we be prepared to accept China can be? Uh, I've got Taiwan in mind. Yeah, but China is not... This is the key point. China does not represent a a contiguous threat to Australia. I mean, I think, look... the. One, the, key, the, key, the key point is this, I think, is that China is not about turning over the existing world order. It only wants to reform it. And it wants to reform it because of its own scale, right? It signed up to the WTO. It signed up to the IMF. It signed up to the World Bank. It signed up to the WHO, the World Health Organization. And as you read recently, it now wants to sign up to the TPP, you know, um, in other words, it's the proselytizer of globalisation in the world. It's not pursuing... It's not, this is not the old Soviet Union pursuing some international ideolo- uh, uh, ideology, some, whether universal or otherwise. It wants to be in the existing order, has signed up the existing order, but wants it reformed so it's fair. I mean, look, the Americans knocked them off. As China grew, their share of the IMF vote should have grown. The Americans denied them. As China grew, their shares of the World Bank should have grown. The Americans denied them, you know. The Chinese, the Americans say, we believe in, you know, the free passage of ships, but they won't sign up to the international law of the sea, you know. (laughs) You know, the Chinese are not about turning over the international system. That's the key point. They might not be about turning over the international system, but they certainly uh, have become much more aggressive about Taiwan... Yeah. Uh, and it's seen as a flashpoint of, 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 of a potential flashpoint with the Americans. Yeah. Uh, should should we just accept at some point that uh, that China will take a military or other approach to take over Taiwan? Well, let me. Know. The first point is Taiwan is not a vital Australian interest. Let me repeat that. Taiwan is not a vital Australian interest. You know, we have no alliance with Taipei. None. There's no document you can find. We do not recognise it as a sovereign state, right? And under ANZUS, ANZUS commits us to consult in the event of an attack on US forces, but not an attack by US forces, right? We are committed to ANZUS for an attack on US forces, but we are not committed under ANZUS to, to an attack by US forces, which means Australia should not be drawn, in my view, into a military engagement over Taiwan, US-sponsored or otherwise, you know. 
as Xi Jinping said recently, we'll try and resolve this, you know, harmoniously. You've got to remember this. The KMT, when they drifted over to Taipei, always said, this is China. The Chinese have always said, no, we are China. They all agree they're one China. So when this, look, when Chen Sui Ban was elected president of, of uh, Taiwan in the late 90s, the Chinese had to make a decision about what to do about it. Because the KMT, while, while under Chiang Kai-shek, were at odds with them by 30, 40 years later, they'd all agree it was really one China, you know. And, and um, um, uh, 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 what was I going to say to you? I just forgot the point. Um, uh, um, uh, yeah, that's it. So Chen Chi Chen, then Foreign Minister of China, said about Chen Sui Ban's election, he said, Taiwan can have its own political system. It can have its own parliament. It can have its own flag. It can have its own system of laws. It can have its own economy. It just cannot say it's not Chinese. So that was the formula. They can have all of this, but they cannot say it's not Chinese. The only time the Chinese will attack or be involved with Taiwan is if the Americans and Ty the Taiwanese try and declare a change in the status of Taiwan. If Taiwan stays as it is, I think Xi Jinping's general point, and this has been the point of other Chinese presidents, that harmoniously the Chinese people in what would otherwise be a civil war will come to terms with one another. You've got to remember, the trade between the two is enormous. The trade between Taiwan, which is a magnificent economy, and China is huge. You know, I mean, Taiwanese own chunks of, you know, Shanghai. I mean, they all own properties, you know. They, I mean, you've got to understand how this place works, you know. But, you know, so, so the thing is, under ANZUS, we have no commitments uh, to be supporting any, any ill-conceived US attempts to try and blow this up. But frankly, I don't think the United States will, you know. What should we be doing now to rebuild our relationship with China then? Well, get, at least give it... At least give it respect. I mean, you know, having Maurice Payne on Insiders, which is a sort of peekaboo, you know, for him, show for insomniacs, you know, um, uh, tell without it, I understand, a Cabinet decision, no, no, we're going to put inspectors into... Wuhan about the uh, virus. Uh, there's even, I think in her language, there was even talk about uh, uh, inspectors of the kind we had for the nuclear inspection of Iraq, you know, this sort of stuff. You know, this is... It, it, it won us nothing that was going to happen anyway under the WTO. It cost us hugely. Um, you know, we we had knocked them off in lots of... lots of... Um, uh, for, uh, lots of... Uh, um, uh, equity transactions in Australia, we'd refuse them. We'd put tariffs on their goods, which are still being fought over in the WTO to this day, you know. And so, so what the Chinese want, I think, is respect for what they've created, you know. I mean, what were we to leave them with? You know, I mean, our central proposition should be that... The rise, of, the rise of China um, is, is entirely valid. What, what, would, what were we to leave them? To, to be hanging around in poverty, five families to a little house, one toilet, bad sanitation, no education, you know, for 20% of humanity, you know. 20% of humanity drags themselves out of poverty and we say, oh, no, no, this is not right. You've got to stay in the mud. Know your place. Stay down there in the mud. And the Chinese say, well, hang on, hang on. It's taken us 40 years to get to $10,000 US per head. Isn't that, isn't, that, isn't, that, isn't that good for you, us? Isn't that good for Australia? Isn't that good for the world? Cheaper goods, buying your iron ore, selling your cheap, you know, flat-screen TVs, you know, all the rest of the thing. Isn't that good? Don't we feel, isn't it better that 20% of humanity have been dragged out of poverty? We should say Yes. You know, I think what the Chinese want is the acknowledgement of what they have, the validity of what they've done, you know, and what they have created, you know. The legitimacy, the, the, the legitimacy of the rise of China from its 
from its colonial past and from its poverty. So uh, the Australia's ambassador to Washington, Arthur Sinodinus, has said something explicitly today, which has sort of been around in, uh, in the background of the AUKUS arrangement, which is essentially that nuclear submarines give us the capacity to be forward, uh, in a forward strategic position in the South China Sea rather than in the defence of yeah, Australia. Give us a break. Give us a break. Yeah, yeah. So... Essentially, we're, we're, what should our defence posture be right now in the, in, within that strategic eight, framework? Eight submarines against China. When we get the submarines in 20 years' time, we, it'll be like throwing a, a handful of toothpicks at a mountain. A handful of toothpicks at a mountain. You know, I mean, Kim Beasley and I built the Collins-class submarines, you know. Kim always had the Admiral's hat on. I had the money and the guns, you know. I built the Collins, you know. I built the Anzac frigates. They were built for the for the for the defence of Australia. You know, their range was to stop any incoming vessels, military vessels against us. What Cenodinus is talking about are attack class submarines to attack to, to con contain Chinese submarines, the hunter killer submarines, to attack them and knock them out. You know? Now What's that got to do with the defence of Australia? And what, possibly, what possible impact could we have militarily with eight submarines which might... You've got, you just say this about the submarines. These Virginia-class submarines were designed in the 1990s. By the time we have half a dozen of them, it'll be 2045 or 50. They'll be 50 or 60 years old. In other words, our new submarines will be old tech, It'd be like buying an old 747, you know. Um, and here we are, we're going to wait, you know, 20-odd years to get the first one and 35 or 40 years to get the, get the, get the lot, you know, uh, for these, um, for these uh, what will be then very old, very old boats. I mean, in fact, the newest submarine in the world, the newest design one, is a French low-enriched nuclear one. If we'd have been looking at, sensibly looking at, thinking, no, we need more range than the Collins can provide at three and a half thousand tonnes, we need to go to four and a half or five. The obvious choice, if we were unhappy with diesels, the obvious choice was the most modern submarine on the drawing board, which is the French nuclear submarine. No, no, we're rushing over. This has got, you know... Uh, the Liberal Party fingerprints all over it. No, we're rushing back to the Americans, right? So we're going to rush back to to a dated a dated design with these things. But but the whole point of these hunter killer submarines is to round up the Chinese nuclear submarines and keep them in the shallow waters on the Chinese continental shelf before they can get into the Mariana Trench and become invisible. In other words, to stop the Chinese having a second strike nuclear capability against the United States, right? So this is the game we're now in. In the Collins game, we're in the defence of Australia. Uh, in, the, in the Virginia class game, we are hunter-killing Chinese submarines. This changes our whole relationship, and that's confirmed by our ambassador. I mean, this is, this is, how, this is how stupid and bald they are. How important uh, is the um, it, w w w how important was I suppose or is uh, the uh, the role of the French and the Europeans and other powers in showing an interest in the Pacific? Oh, hugely important. Look, you know, the French had a great relationship with India because De Gaulle pulled out of out of NATO. Uh, the Americans pushed, uh, like they pushed the Labor Prime Minister of Iran, Mossadegh, out in favour of the Shah. You know, everything they touch turns to, you know what. Um, uh, they pushed Indira Gandhi away and she, she, she tied up with the Soviet Union. When de Gaulle turned his back on NATO, went independent, they developed a relationship with India. The, China, the French were introducing us into that relationship. In fact, a third meeting of India, France and Australia was to be held the week the submarine was cancelled. And so the meeting got cancelled. I mean, France is 
is the is the sole nuclear European power. Germany, a larger country, doesn't have nuclear weapons and doesn't have the sophistication of, of supersonic aircraft or nuclear submarines. The French have 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 geographic assets in the Pacific, you know. It is it is a strangely but truly a European power with a Pacific com complexion. What do we do? We treat them appallingly. You know, we walk away from... I mean, I mean, if we're unhappy about the fact that we're having trouble trying to stuff a diesel engine into a, the hull of a French nuclear submarine, why didn't we at least inquire about their most modern nuclear submarine? You know, this is all about... You know, um, what's this young guy that works... Uh, that person that works in PMC? Uh, um, uh, Andrew Shearer, yes. Uh, Andrew Shearer. See, Andrew Shearer's this world can't wait to get the staplers back onto the Americans and you've got the ambassador, you know, a, a local Sydney genius out there telling us now, no, by the way, we want... You know, why would we need seakeeping for Australia's submarines in the defence of Australia that, are, uh, that have are able to stand off the Chinese coast 13 flying hours away if it's not to attack Chinese naval assets? And when you start attacking Chinese naval assets, you're a different state. See, look, the Chinese, hard-nosed as they are, would say, look, Australia's got these Collins-class submarines, they're effective, they're quiet, but they're not in our field. They're theirs, right? We're not going down there. We don't care. No, no, we're saying, oh, no, 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 no. We've got a better story for you. We're going to get attack, American nuclear attack-class submarines that can stay on station. And you know what we'll do? We'll hunt your submarines down in the shallow waters of your, of your continental plate. You know, beauty, beauty, you know. So, so my final question to you before we go to, the, uh, to, to my colleagues in C Canberra is coming back to your point about Indonesia and ASEAN, you say that they should be at the centre of our thinking. Yeah, sure. How would that work? I mean, are you talking about sort of liaison with the Indonesian army? Well, look, how, how, I, I put together, as you know, a security treaty with President Suharto and the government of Indonesia and the army of Indonesia with Hans's words. It's the last thing I did as Prime Minister in November 1995, right? John Howard lost that with President Habibi over our skiting over Timor. You know, Habibi suspended it. But you just imagine... If we'd have spent the last 25 years putting Indonesian officers through our staff colleges, 25 years in security terms with, the, with, the, with Indonesia and its army, instead of Iraq and Afghanistan, instead of Howard's little escapades, if we'd have stuck to my script, imagine how much safer Australia would be now if we were back to that relationship. I mean... We have now just a peripheral relationship with Indonesia, the central state in our security. The central state geographically for our security is Indonesia. We have a peripheral relationship with them. And, of course, in ASEAN, every leader in ASEAN knows that we have no relationship with Beijing. So why would the Prime Minister of Malaysia or Singapore uh, or, or Thailand talk to us about East Asia when we are non-speakies with the biggest power, the Chinese? If we'd have played our cards properly and weren't running off to Iraq and running off there, but focusing on where we live, on our geography, we would either be the Secretariat of ASEAN or at least a member. And where are we now? Nowhere. So we'll move to our questions from the Canberra Press Gallery in Canberra, uh, starting with Stephen Jedgetts from the ABC. Thanks, Laura, and thanks, Mr Keating, for your remarks today. Uh, you've said that you believe that China is in its adolescence when it comes to its diplomacy, which seems to imply that you believe that China will moderate uh, or mature in both word and deed uh, over the coming years. Can I ask, what gives you the confidence to make that assessment, if I've assessed you correctly, given that most preeminent scholars of China believe that China's turn towards greater authoritarianism may well see it become not only more unpredictable, but more likely to behave in a hostile manner in coming years. Well, it, it has become, you're correct, it has become more authoritarian. There's no doubt about that. You know, 
you know, civil surveillance at home, uh, 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 all the rest. Uh, but uh, at the same time, it wants to be part of the world. I made the points earlier. It had joined the WTO. Uh, it, it had joined the IMF, the World Bank. It now wants to join the TPP. It, it's clear to anybody that China does not want to overturn the international system. Xi Jinping, three years ago, was in Davos speaking in favour of globalisation. They're out there this week speaking about globalisation again. So, therefore, I just... Uh, even, though, even though things are tighter at home than they've been politically, um, there's also a lot of other good things going on. I mean, they're not going to have... They're knocking over the big... Uh, appropriately knocking over the big uh, uh, tech platforms, which the Americans have not... I mean, in America, you want search, you've got Google. You want social policy, you've got Facebook. You know, you want you want software, you've got Microsoft. That's it, you know. Um, the Chinese are going to have a much more civil society. They're, they're going to make sure that, the, that, that they are seeking to have the extremes of wealth moderated and they want these big platforms operating in a socially good way. So I think that China will become, notwithstanding uh, your point, which I agree with, it has become more authoritarian, it will be a more civil society than the United States. I mean, there were 83 school shootings in America since 2018. 83. 83. People carrying guns around. I mean, it's a crazy land. 24... The average run rate now, 24 schools get attacked by gun by shooters every year in the United States. You know, it's not civil. You saw what Trump did trying to overturn the election. You know, you've still got a big a, a pile of Republicans still believe that that president that 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 president, the current president, was not legally elected. Now, you know, the great challenge for the United States is for its remoralisation. There's a challenge for China for its moralisation and these, these questions about surveillance and the rest. But the challenge for America and the, under, under, the underpinnings of American greatness or return to American greatness is its own remoralisation. No more unlimited attacks like Iraq... Afghanistan, like the Arab Spring, uh, like knocking off Shah Reza, uh, knocking off Mossadegh in Iran, like the fight in Vietnam. I mean, you know, um, so the key point, the key takeaway is China's showing every reason to remain in the system. The other thing is it's not the Soviet Union. It's not, it's not pushing an ideology. It does want, not want to command three oceans like the United States. It does not want to command the Atlantic. It does not want to command the Mediterranean. It's interested in the corner of one ocean, its ocean, you know? The next question is from Daniel Hurst. Daniel Hurst from Guardian Australia. Mr Keating, um, you called for a sensible relationship between Australia and China. In your view, is there space in that sensible relationship for Australia to speak up on human rights? particularly in Hong Kong and Xinjiang. And secondly, you talked about Taiwan. China wants its front doorstop and its front porch. Um, are the most recent actions, including the incursions into Taiwan's air defence identification zones, consistent with what you said about Xi Jinping pledging to do it peacefully? Um, just give me the first part of the question again. Just looking for first, first part is, in, what, in your prescription of a sensible relationship between Australia and China, is there space for Australia to raise human rights issues? should always speak out on human rights. We should always reserve the right to speak out on human rights, whether it's the Uyghurs in China. But can I also say it's the Muslims in Kashmir. You know, here's, here's Modi, President Prime Minister Modi, our new friend, who has suspended, repudiated uh, the, uh, the, the autonomy of Kashmir, which is 94% Muslim, no, no wave of indignation in the Sydney Morning Herald or the Age about that. I mean, India's an ally. We don't talk about allies. We only talk about national enemies, you know. So I believe Australia should always have the right to speak 
in support of, but it can't be, and this is the key point, you can speak powerfully about the rights of citizens of these countries, but it can't be the whole conversation. That doesn't displace the wider country-to-country, nation-to-nation conversation about these states. In other words, you can't let the human rights discussion supplant wholly and completely the relationship between the countries. There was a point about uh, the incursions into the Taiwan... Sorry. Uh, uh, there's no incursion in Taiwan. There's o they're overflying their airspace. So that's, I didn't quite get the point. You know, but as I said, I said, look, Taiwan is fundamentally a civil war matter with the Chinese... A civil matter, not a civil war, a civil matter with the Chinese. Both of them, the whole world has regarded China and Taiwan as one, one country. The Taiwanese have regarded as one country. The Chinese, one country. The Chen Chi Chen model is you can have everything you want, you just can't say you're not Chinese. And unless Taiwan changes, tries to change its status, then I just don't think you'll see military action by the Chinese, by the PRC, against Taiwan. Next question is from Anna Henderson. Anna Henderson from SBS World News, Mr Keating. Can I take you briefly away from the international to the domestic and just get your response to a question about the Native Title Act? Your government introduced it. We've seen recent examples of destruction of cultural sites of great significance to First Nations Australians. What's your assessment of the system as it stands now? I'm here fundamentally to talk about Australia's strategic settings. I don't want to get into domestic issues. You know, I'm very proud of the Native Title Act. You know, uh, every bit of political skill I had and every bit of heft I had it took to get that thing through. Uh, 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 Indigenous Australians now have about, uh, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but about 67% title to the, land, the landscape of Australia. Um, and through that title... They enjoy autonomy and, and over time wealth. Uh, 200 years after, we, we stole the title from them, you know. Um, uh, so uh, I, there, there are no doubt, I mean, I made speeches in the past about reversing the, reversing the onus on native title, native title group not having to prove that they have broke association with the land as... Uh, a more literal translation of this by the high, high Court since has said, but by and large, we did make a lot of progress with the Native Title Act, but I don't think this is not the time for me to discuss it. Thank you. Anthony Galloway. Uh, thank you, Mr Keating. Uh, Anthony Galloway from your favourite newspaper, The Sydney Morning Herald. Um, I was wondering if I could ask about your, your comments um, in terms of China wanting to influence the stand countries, including Pakistan, isn't um, some of those activities, particularly the Belt and Road activities in countries like Pakistan, what is in part drawing India to the east? Well, look, the stand countries were marooned in the Soviet Union. I mean, the Soviet Union was poor. The stand countries were dirt poor. And they've sat there, no one has cared about their... They're rich in minerals, they're rich in resources. No one has, has cared about them. Um, not India, not even India. India might have strategically cared about them, but certainly didn't help them. What the Belt and Road Initiative is about, I think, is about uh, lifting the quality of life and, and, and infrastructure and resources of those countries. Now... There'll be lots of players in this, as there is already in the Belt and Road Initiative. The principal player, though, will be China. And China will have, China will have, as I said earlier, very broad influence uh, in between its western border and basically Istanbul. Now, this is a matter, of course, of interest to the, to the Indians, but, of course, we have the Great Wall of the Himalayas sitting there in between. I mean, India is in such a good position. It's got a wall that's impenetrable in the Himalayas. It's got a, a distended peninsula with, with oceans and the Bay of Biscay with water all around it. It's got 1.4 billion young, mainly young people, very young age. So China, uh, India is in a very advantageous position strategically. I don't think they're too worried about the Chinese and the stand countries 
and they would enjoy a lot of commerce into India uh, and from India into the stand countries. Um, uh, and um, uh, the, the last time I met uh, 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 Xi Jinping, I was with Larry Summers, and um, after meeting, he said to me, what do you think of this? I said, well, look, your country's been blessed. When the Mayflower arrived, you've got this arable land, you've got an ocean either side of you, you've got the Atlantic on one side and the Pacific on the other, and friends north and south in Canada and in Mexico. But as, as powerful as that is for you, it's now a corset. It's a corset on you, whereas the Chinese don't have the corset. The Chinese have got stay within their bowl, basically. They've got Siberia to the north, they've got the Himalayas to the west, uh, they've got Vietnam and Indochina to the south, and they've got this breakthrough to the stand, the stand countries. I said, what will happen, in my view, is that China, apart from being the largest economic state in the world, will be the most resourced economic state and will have much more broad strategic power by having that pathway through to, to Istanbul. And basically now there's 27 Chinese cities are now connected to European cities by rail. 27 now by rail, you know. I mean, China's now got 32 cities serviced by trains at 300 kilometres an hour, you know. You know, here's our old friend, what's his name, the Chinese, the, Jap, the British Prime Minister. Um, Johnson. Uh, yeah. You know, you know, waxing lyrical down there in Cornwall. I mean, Britain is like an old theme park sliding into the Atlantic compared to modern China. You know, I mean, China's just going to be huge, particularly as it grows that influence through there. But they will welcome, at the same time, China will welcome Indian corporate involvement in the, in the stand countries. It won't be all theirs. Tom Connell. Oh, I'll It'll be good on occasions. But on national strategic policy... On, broadly, you know, on China and on China, it's been appalling. I mean, the media generally, in terms of the balance of the debate on Australia and China, has been broadly appalling, you know. And that's part of the reason I'm here today. Tom Connell. Tom Connell from Sky News. Mr Keating, we're talking a lot about China's motives and what people think China might do in the future. It strikes me the most relevant person to talk about is President Xi. He's likely to become, one way or another, effectively president for life. Should that be a concern? Should that ring alarm bells considering the leaders for life we've had since the 20th century? Well, it's, 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 not, uh, I mean, it's a good way to stay in power, I guess. It's not my way, you know. Um, you know, uh, I actually believe in a community's right to dismiss the government, you know. Um, but you've got to remember that China... Uh, uh, you know, China is um, um, just going past the, the central point about the president's attempts to, at longevity. Uh, China is broadly a Confucian society that believes in harmony, in authority, uh, and it is with this background that it accepts, I think, broadly the role of the Chinese Communist Party. I mean, the idea that we have, if you don't vote at the local ballot box, that is, if you are not a Jeffersonian liberal, then you're, then, then, then you're a savage, uh, belies the fact that China's got a 4,000-year history which has these characteristics about it. So I think that... that uh, you see, let me make a further point to you, and it's an important point. That is, Premier Xiao Ziang and Hu Yabang, the party secretary, with the support of Dong Xiaoping, wanted to move to at least some sort of multi-party system uh, in China, within the party and then external to the party. When Hu Yabang died of cancer and and the demonstrations were put on by the students in Tiananmen Square, the whole thing came crashing down. The student 
demonstrations. I mean, I I was actually in Beijing. I saw Zhao Ziyang cry in front of me about his inability to talk the students out of the demonstrations. What happened was Dong Xiaoping said, that's it, the party has to come first. I was prepared to try this. I was prepared to try the multi-party route with, with, with Zhao Ziyang and with, uh, with Hu Yabang. But look, it happened. I've got to go with the Conservatives. I've got to put the party number one. The party has been number one since then. What happened, Xi Jinping has inherited basically the Deng Xiaoping decision about the party. And, and of course, as you know, in the Hu Jintou years, in the 10 years that Hu Jintou was president, corruption was rampant, ramp, absolutely rampant in China. And I think Xi Jinping understands that the legitimacy of the party couldn't stand the corruption. It's the same. He took the same decision Lee Kuan Yew took. Lee Kuan Yew took the decision that Singapore could not have the command of the People's Actions Party there if people thought people were taking money on the sly and the place was corrupt. And so Xi Jinping had this war against the corruption uh, and... and, uh, and he has, as Dung had made the decision, kept the party number one. Now, does that excuse, you know, surveillance of the community with face re facial recognition technology? No. Does it excuse uh, their, 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 their attempts to sort of control the internet and the content of it? No. You know, but nevertheless, there is a, a background in Chinese society which is about harmony which has a Confucian basis to it, which we don't understand in the West and I've never had in the West. Now, does all that add up to mean, yes, this guy is better with another term? I don't think it does. You know, I would like to see the President of China in the rules the Chinese have had where they've had terms, you know, I think it was 10 years, which I think is long enough. Most leaders are around 10 years. They either get tired of the job or tired in the job, you know. So... But then the other thing is, because Xi Jinping has made so many enemies, so many enemies in knocking out the corruption, he may believe in personal terms, if he's not the president, he's at personal risk himself. This could be a consideration. But I'm not that close to, to China these days as I used to be. Mark Kenny. Uh, Mark Kenny, Mr Keating, thank you for your address. I'm from ANU and, of course, a uh, director of the Press Club. Um, you've said big states are rude and, of course, big powers secure their perimeters. One thinks of Alaska and Hawaii, for example, in the US case. Are there any lessons, in your view, from NATO's... Um, I think you've referred to it in the past as nibbling away at the pie crust of the old Soviet Union with the Baltic states. I'm wondering if there are any lessons there that uh, you believe apply now in terms of understanding China's, you know, geographic assertion? Well, Mark, the great opportunity for the United States at the end of the Cold War was to consolidate the Atlantic. I've said this in speech after speech. I said it to Bill Clinton. I've said it to economic advisers uh, since, uh, foreign policy advisers since. Um, when the Cold War finished, when the wall came down, uh, 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 when when uh, Gorbachev left and uh, uh, what was his name, um, uh, the pre president, uh, the new president took over, um, the Americans had a real chance of bringing Russia into Europe, um, and if not into the EU, into some operating closeness with Europe, having some understanding that in the end China with a population four times that of the United States, will end up being, again, the central power in Asia. So if you wanted to balance off American power in the world, you would have consolidated Europe. You had the United States itself, Canada and Mexico. You had the European economy, which is about $30 trillion today. You had NATO as it stood. Uh, the great challenge was to bring Russia into, into Europe. What did they do? They did exactly the wrong thing, you know, led by that fellow, uh, name escapes me now, it'll come to me in a second. Uh, they couldn't resist putting Hungary, Poland, the Czech Republic into NATO. Uh, then, then the Baltic states. Uh, um, 
NATO's border from Moscow was 1,200 miles away uh, before the war came down. It's 71 miles away now. The Russians have hated it. Of course, the northern European plain, which is as flat as a tack, runs from the north of France to St Petersburg and to Moscow. I mean, Bonaparte went over it, Hitler went over it, and the Red Army came back over it into Berlin. Uh, there are no mountains, there are no big rivers. It is not protectable. Instead of that, no, what is it, what's the United States do? It bites off bits of the pie crust, so it, it, it annoys every Russian nationalist. And even though the, the Americans didn't create Putin, they did a very big job in lifting Putin to the position he is in now. Putin commands Russian nationalism in the in the fight, in the scale of these lost the, the, of, of these lost territories. Now they were never to be part of the old Soviet Union that was gone, but the bridging land, the bridging land between Germany and Russia, that is Poland, Hungary, these countries, could have been left in the common in, in, into the EU. The challenge was to get them into the EU, not into NATO. And so the Americans made it, you know, probably the greatest post-war blunder in the extension of NATO, thereby denying and making much harder and perhaps later bringing, bringing Russia into Europe. If Russia was in Europe and, Europe, and there was a, a much better intra-European relationship than now with France and Germany... And the United States, you look at, look at the US, 20-odd trillion of GDP, uh, Europe, 30 trillion of GDP, uh, throwing Mexico and Canada are about 40 trillion of GDP. Even the Chinese at the best are going to get to 20, in the long run, 40. So, in other words, if you were the United States and you wanted your centre of power, you would have had it in the Atlantic. So that, the United States is still pretending it can be the security guarantor of Asia, not just the Atlantic, of Asia despite the fact that China is already one and a quarter times larger and will soon be two times larger, you know? So what, what it should be is that is this. The United States should be the guarantor and the leader of the West. It should, in East Asia, be the balancer and the conciliator. In other words, it's important to have American military power in Asia to deal with any pushiness by other states, including including China, um, as the balancing and conciliating power. But the idea that we can maintain, that America can maintain strategic primacy in Asia, which was what the pivot was all about. I mean, the reason I hopped into Gillard and into Obama at the time and Hillary Clinton is that they believed, you know, against all the odds that the United States could, could, could command three oceans, including the Western Pacific, and be the predominant military power in Asia, despite the fact that China was then nearly the same size as the United States and soon to be larger. So that's how I see it. That's how I see it. I think the opportunity of bringing Russia into Europe still exists, in which case Europe becomes a pole, a P-O-L-E, a pole. China will be a pole. But the United States trying to command both poles off an economy which is half the size of China and a quarter the size of its population is, of course, just wishful thinking. Andrew Green. Mr Keating, from what I understand of your comments on Taiwan, you don't believe there will be a military confrontation in the immediate future, certainly one that doesn't involve the US. If China were to take Taiwan by force... Uh, what do you think Australia's response should be? And given what we've seen already with Hong Kong, uh, Xinjiang and the fortification of the South China Sea against international rulings, to quote an elder statesman, do you get the feeling that China is doing the West slowly? Look, I said in my remarks earlier, Taiwan is not a vital Australian interest. That is... We, that is... Uh, we have no alliance with Taipei. There's no piece of paper sitting in Canberra which has an alliance with Taipei. Um, we do not recognise it as a sovereign state. We've always seen it as part of China. Um, and in militarily, the only military responses, which could be between Taiwan itself and China, 
were the United States to involve itself, I made clear earlier that ANZUS commits us uh, to, uh, uh, to uh, consult in the event of an attack on US forces, but not an attack by US forces. I mean, this is a very important point. So my view is Australia should not be drawn into a military engagement over Taiwan, US, US sponsored or otherwise, you know. Now, you, you mentioned other things there about um, Hong Kong, etc. Look at look what India has done in Kashmir. You know, they've suspended, repudiated the autonomy of Kashmir, 94% Muslims, you know. What do we do? Do we employ the same policies against India, the same rhetoric that we've had against China on Hong Kong? I mean, after all, Hong Kong was always part of China and Taiwan. Or is it just a sort of China-centric debate? And by the way, if you're a half an ally, notwithstanding the Russians are your best pals, you can knock off the Kashmiris and we, we won't say anything about it. Kim Bergman. Uh, thank you, Mr Keating. Kim Bergman from Asia Pacific Defence Reporter. Uh, getting back to the AUKUS alliance, which looks like a bit of a return to the Anglosphere, what do you think the UK gets out of it and can you see them ever coming to our rescue? Look... You know, poor old coconut head Johnson. I mean, talk about fantasies. Do you know, Britain took its major battleships out of East Asia in 1904. You know, it had a it had a half a bet on Singapore in the 1940s, and that failed. Then in the 1950s, they withdrew from Asia completely. You know. The idea that the British could have any role here, any important role. I mean, the Chinese have got 63 submarines now. How long do you reckon that aircraft carrier of theirs would have lasted, you know, in, in, in a real dust-up, you know? Can Britain help us here? No, you know? The one state that was able to help us was France, and, of course, we rudely turned our back upon it. And I made the point earlier. If I mean, let me just make this point about the submarines. I think it's a point worth making. In my time, we built the Collins. We won't be able to wait for the antiquated Virginia-class submarines to arrive when there's half a dozen of them, in other words, a force of them, in the 2040s and 50s. I believe we're going to have to do two important things. We're going to have to rapidly rebuild the Collins class, the existing submarines, but also build another class of conventional Australian submarines. In other words, a son of Collins or a daughter of Collins, however we like to talk about ships at sea, that we should be thinking now about a traditional uh, diesel-powered, uh, quiet, effective submarine with reasonable range, which we could well and truly build with our own resources uh, before these hunter-killer uh, Virginia-class submarines arrive. And if we don't think that's a solution, we ought to... We, we ought to... Uh, uh, this would take a bit of doing, given relations, go back to the French and say, well, look, let's have another look at your modern, low-enriched nuclear uh, submarine, which will be the most modern in the world and not 30 years old like the Virginia's or the British submarines. So the British submarines are a waste of time, in my opinion, uh, and joining the hunter... Look, our submarines, if we were to buy an eight American Virginia-class submarines, they'll simply be part of the United States force directed by the United States. Essentially, we will be buying for the United States eight submarines for them to use and employ, you know? We're already being told you need uh, you need uh, nuclear capable engineers on board the submarines anyway, Australian submarines, uh, and 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 we'd 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 be in, in that position. So, um, i my view is that we ought to get cracking immediately on the restoration of the Collins the existing Collins class boats. I think we should build a new son of Collins from. Get, get onto that straight away. But if we think that's beyond us, let's get an off-the-shelf French nuclear boat, which will be the most modern of its kind.
Jonathan Kersley. Thanks, Laura. Thanks, Mr Keating. Jonathan Kersley from Nine News. Mr Keating, you mentioned during your remarks what China wants is acknowledgement of validity of what they have done and what they have created. But we know what they want. A year ago, the Chinese embassy handed me this list of 14 grievances, 14 demands, everything from foreign investment decisions, banning Huawei, the politicisation and stigmatisation of normal exchanges, calling for an independent inquiry into the origins of coronavirus, uh, issues of free speech and issues that go to the heart of a democracy. Which of these 14 items would you be prepared to negotiate on? The, the key point is, 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 a, is, has a, is the rise of China legitimate? Is taking 20% of humanity, 1.4 billion people from abject poverty, you know, five, four and six families living in one, one house, poor sanitation, poor education, is this something the world should welcome and be proud of? And in our terms, of course, it's completely remodelled the Australian economy. Look at the, look at the wealth we've had out of iron ore and coking coal and the other, the other uh, uh, exports we've had. But, of course, the subsidisation of our inflation rate for 25 years by the import of low-cost, high-quality uh, Chinese goods. So, you know, the, 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 the key is to recognise if we give China the recognition, I believe it is due in terms of its legitimacy in turning 20% of the Earth's population back into something approaching even $10,000 a head, uh, then I think a lot of these issues, the so-called 14 points, sort of fall off the table. It depends whether you really want to be in this or not. Do you want to be in it? Or are we back to, you know, back to Cornwall trying to find our security from Asia? This is a central point. Does Australia... I mean, the reason I'm here, I'm saying we've lost our way. We've lost our way because, basically, we don't want to be in it. We're trying to find, doing everything to find our security from Asia and not in Asia. Now, if we get back to the region, to the neighbourhood, to Indonesia, to ASEAN, the countries nearby, a sensible working relationship with China, you know, support for the United States and Asia, we've got a proper framework. The framework we always had. Look, look how powerful we were. I mean, you know, Gareth Evans did, the, when he was the foreign minister, the Cambodia peace accords. You know, I did the APEC leaders meeting. Bob did the uh, APEC uh, general, inf uh, 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 gen general resources uh, meetings, Bob Hawke. Um, um, you know, uh, 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 Kevin Rudd uh, was involved, uh, 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 built uh, uh, a very hard, large measure, the East Asia Summit. You know, we were the, the, we were the go-to people. We were the go-to people. It, we, we brought that bit of software that these countries didn't have, foreign policy. Where are we now? You know, or do we go back to, you know, lists of the kind this gentleman has just read out, you know? In other words, you know, some minor official in the Chinese embassy said this, so that's the end of a relationship with China, you know. Greg Brown. Greg Brown from The Australian. Uh, Mr Keating, on the geopolitics of climate change, do you buy into the argument that Australia's climate change policy has done us damage internationally, or do you think that's overdone? And, and with Labor uh, set to announce its climate policy within weeks, do you think it's more important that Anthony Albanese sets a 2030 target that sends a signal that Australia will be a global leader on climate in the range of 45 to 50%? Or is it more important that Albanese sets a target that reassures Australians that Labor will be a safe pair of hands in managing the transition? I made it clear to Laura and to the press club that the point of my address was the strategic framework of Australia. I don't want to get into contemporary issues, including cl climate change. You know, we've all... We've all got views about climate change and what each of the parties should do, will do, may do, uh, but I'd rather stick... Rather, ra rather than be taken off on a tangent there, stick to the main, uh, the main discussion. Karen Barlow. 
Uh, Karen Barlow from the Canberra Times. Thank you for your address, Mr Keating. I was just wondering what you thought of the um, post-truth world we're in at the moment, the post-truth miasma, particularly when it comes to diplomacy, and particularly on AUKUS, you were uh, straight off the bat highly critical of Labor's response to the AUKUS deal. I was wondering if that had been allayed in any way in recent times. No. no. Both the parties have lost their way in respect of Australian foreign policy. This is the fact of the matter. You know, the Labor Party had the chance when the government said they're going to take 20 months to think about the submarine, that is, whether or not it was an option to go for a nuclear, um, an American or British nuclear submarine. We, Labor Party was completely in a position of saying we are not, you know, necessarily against nuclear power, but we have at least 20 months to think about what are the right options here. Now, you can see already in just a, a month or less how questions are now coming to the fore about... about the value of any choice in respect of Virginia-class submarines, you know? I mean, instead of that, Labor gets a briefing what, one night and by 11 o'clock the next morning, they're in the cart, you know? They've taken a position, certainly, certainly Penny Wong's taken a position, there shouldn't be an ounce of daylight between her and, and the Liberal Party, that is, Julia Bishop and Maurice Payne. Now, that way, you end up with a reasonably quiet political life. You have no big disputes because you're glued up onto the government. But you make no national progress. You know, here's the Labor Party used to be able to lay out, lay out a proud history of engagement with Asia, you know, and including China. You never hear about it. It's just gone past. It's now sort of debate trickery goes on. So, you know, the, the, the reason I'm on this program, I mean, I didn't rush back here 26 years later, uh, I was not rushing back. I'm here to say that the parties, in respect of their current policies, are fundamentally not up to it, both of them. That is, the Coalition and the Labor Party, you know? And the Australian people are entitled to know that China is not going to try and rip up the system. China is not going to be attacking people. It doesn't take contiguous states, you know, we can have a civil relationship with them, even though we agree, disagree on a range of other issues, you know, and that, our, and and that if we have to witness the appalling event of our prime minister turning up in Cornwall of all places, where Captain Cook and Arthur Phillip left 250 years earlier, that says all about the relevance of the political parties currently. Mr. Keating, uh, you've given us a lot to think about today. Thank you for your time. Pleasure. Thank you to the Press Club. And we will see you at the next Westpac address.